Um, this is a, a sum of, in Pendle's case, 3.6 million that the um, earmark for investment in Pendle um, it effectively replaces the former European funding which um, we've benefited on that we've got to considerable period of time. Now that 3.6 million sounds like a lot, however, uh, it's spread over three financial years and it has to cover a multiplicity of different priorities. I think there are some 40 plus priorities in the government's list. Now, one of the funding streams that it would aim to replace, um, we are told, has benefited from some £110 million pounds of European funding uh, for the whole of Lancashire. And that uh, is a programme to assist adults into employment and to tackle um, uh, young people not in uh, education, employment or training. And that's been hugely successful, but the whole of that funding uh, disappears in 2023 and the uh, people who run that programme currently are uh, bidding in together with lots of other different programmes to that 3.6 million in order that that uh, can continue. Now, it, it, in common with other councillors, uh, I've uh, uh, encouraged people to put uh, expressions of interest into doing things with some of that 3.6 million. And uh, a group has been looking very carefully at the investment plan, which is the first stage of putting things forward to government. But uh, the aspirations are up here, uh, the funding is somewhere down there, and the current funding streams are pretty high too, the European sources, and the new funding is, is down the other floor. So it's going to be very difficult in the coming months to actually weave a programme that will meet all the aspirations and actually uh, continue some of those funding programmes which we're going to lose. One aspect that uh, I would very much like to emphasise from a, 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 on a ward basis is that the reference in the uh, uh, government priorities to alleviate flooding and, and uh, reduce the risk of flooding in communities. And at the moment, we've got a, a project in Erie uh, along the new cut, which is uh, uh, best part of two million, uh, uh, supported by European funding, which uh, is reducing the risk of flooding. In future, the next big project is for sort of upstream storage, uh, what's called the waterfalls, and that's going to be. Uh, a multi-million pound project for which there currently isn't any funding. Now, I would very much like to see the uh, UK Shared Prosperity Fund applied uh, to that, but it would take the 3.6 million and another 3.6 million and probably another 3.6 million after that. So I, I think that the prospect of getting any significant progress is, 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 is small, but I would say that put in a plea for that flood alleviation funding to find a high priority when it comes to uh, further funding in the future. Thank you, Councillor. Any other speakers? Councillor Mood. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Is there any uh, progress or any update on the uh, Nelson Con College discussions for, for the A Centre site? Yes. Um, Discussions are ongoing with the college uh, in terms of drafting up the heads of terms for these. Then discussions are ongoing. Thank you. Any other speakers? No, thank you for coming to that report. Uh, then item number eight, then, uh, Central Planning Committee and Area Committee.
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we agree that uh, the annual council to <coughs> change to a new uh, central planning committee, and this report is now before us looking at how the committee is going to operate and uh, the remit the committee will have. So, in terms of how we've got to this stage, uh, advice has been taken from the planning advisory service. Uh, who have guided us and helped us in coming up with this report and how the planning committee, committee should operate. The appendix to the report sets out the delegation, uh, scheme of delegation, uh, and in terms of the application that will come before the plan, planning uh, committee. And for us councillors, uh, for the planning committee to consider a planning application, we will have to make a request in writing with a, a valid planning reason uh, for that to take place. And the challenge we have as a council, as, as members will be aware, is in terms of the performance of the planning department as, as it is. Uh, we are facing some real challenges within that department and if we're not careful, uh, we will have intervention in the near future which will reduce and limit uh, I would say as, as members on especially the major planning applications and I think we all agree that's the last thing we would want to see. <coughs> in terms of the makeup of the committee, uh, the report states out in terms of the numbers would be 6 for 1 uh, and all members who sit on the committee, whether as uh, named members or subs in, in the future, would have to uh, have taken the necessary training to participate in uh, the meetings. In terms of uh, the area committee uh, role, and area committees do play an important role in our local democratic system, and will continue to do so, uh, although the frequency of the meetings is uh, being proposed to be reduced. In terms of the budget uh, for area committees, we've had difficulties in the past where whether it's going to be capital uh, spend or it revenue. So I think with the proposal that's <coughs> put before us, each councillor has £3,000 to spend. And in terms of the ability to spend that money, can be uh, revenue based, which makes it easier for that funding uh, to be spent. On page two, uh, in terms of the working arrangements of the committee, um, so the committee will be named as the planning committee. As I mentioned, the maker will be six, uh, four Conservative, four Labour, one Liberal Democrat. The training point I've already touched upon, and it mentions the frequency of the meetings and the time and the location of where the meetings will take place. I think it's also important in terms of report mentions for members of the public to call in a particular planning <coughs> application. Uh, it's, it's suggested in the report that there would be, there has to be 10 uh, objections from members of the public. I think the view uh, we've taken is, in certain areas that will be quite difficult to achieve in uh, urban areas, uh, sorry, in, in <coughs> rural areas. So my, my suggestion is that we reduce that from 10 to five uh, and in terms of the tier one service sector uh, areas, that stays at 10. In terms of the discussion on parish councils, um, it's important that the parishes are involved within the planning system. So if there's a planning application for a particular area, the parish uh, representative will be invited to uh, attend the meeting and speak, but will not have a vote. So I will move. <coughs> The recommendations uh, uh, and appoint uh, the chairman uh, to be Councillor David Corbyn Price. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Armour. Councillor David Whip, you want to speak? Sorry. I, I want to move an amendment, so we'll have to get a second. Do we have a second for Councillor Armour's motion? So I think this is a logical step forward in the uh, formation of the planning committee and these are also the you know, ideas for the terms and, uh, and conditions of how they work. Um, I 
think the suggestion of, uh, of having 10 as a, a residence threshold for the urban areas, the tier one uh, service centres, I think is the right thing to do and to, uh, to reduce it to five for the rural centres. Um, I think in terms of the training as well, that's particularly vital. So paragraph seven talking about getting the training underway, so both members of the committee and also substitutes are properly trained. Um, I think as, as, as Councillor Arnold alluded to, there is a risk. Um, I was having a chat with, uh, with Neil Watson the other day before we came here in the team, and uh, he basically said that there is a risk that we will have a letter from the government's planning department to say that our failure rate on appeals is too high, and our level of delegation is too low. So those two things are the two things that are driving this kind of thing, to make sure we get the right decisions made, consistently applied, etc., across all the different areas. So that's the, that's the important thing. Um, it's a set of rules for everybody. I think we all sat through the, um, the Open's application just recently, and again, the general public understanding what planning is all about, um, so we can, we, we, we're trained enough to be able to answer the questions and deal with their questions and sort things out that way. Uh, and help them when it comes to understanding, you know, what's a valid objection, how to discuss it and how to present it when it comes to the, uh, the relevant meetings. I think the idea of, as well of um, spreading it across the various locations I think is good. So if there's one in a particular area, if it's in Cone or if it's in Barrow Ford or, or one or whatever, then it's held locally. That way you give you maximum chance of the uh, local residents to, uh, to come along. Um, so I think it's, a, it's a, a set of recommendations with a slight tweak that we mentioned in terms of the, uh, the number of residents who uh, should object um, and therefore I second the recommendations as they stand. Thank you Councillor Rice. Uh, Councillor Witt. Uh, thank you Mr Mayor. I thought um, well, two amendments, but I want to move the, uh, the principal one and then um, we can come to the, the second set of amendments in due course. So the first <coughs> amendment is that um, we delete the uh, wording of the proposal that's on the table and we um, replace that with that the planning committee consider major applications of 60 plus dwellings and applications referred from area committees which would currently go to policy and resources and that the terms of reference for area committees is unaltered. And I move that, Mr Chairman, Mr Mayor, um, because myself and my group feel very strongly that what the Conservatives are trying to do here is dismantle local democracy here in Pendle. Yes. The way in which they are riding roughshod over the local engagement of uh, residents, of local representatives, of parish and town councils, with this wholesale sweeping away of uh, systems that have worked well for the best part of 30 years and given residents and representatives a real role in planning and uh, dealing with planning proposals in their local areas. Um, uh, just tearing all that up and uh, meaning that uh, the centralisation will uh, entail a, a loss of ability and uh, the loss of uh, local people getting uh, uh, their say on very important issues to them. I have to say it's typical of the way that the current Conservative administration uh, are operating but it should not go unchallenged. And the proposals to require 10 objectors um, to come forward in order to, to trigger something going to committee, but for rural areas, oh, it'll only be five <coughs> objectors. Well, you know, in due course, <coughs> we would propose that it remain at three objectors. We are not swamped 
by applications going to committee. The reason why there is a problem with uh, the processing, uh, processing of plan applications is because of inadequate staffing. And you only have to look at the uh, uh, schedules that were presented to policy and resources uh, earlier, showing that the income from planning fees has shot up and the expenditure on planning staff <laughs> has reduced to see that there is an imbalance between the, the, the demand, the, the number of applications that's coming through the door, and the number of people sat behind the door who were able to process them. So it's a much simpler solution than uh, scrapping the role of the area committees and doing away with uh, lots of, uh, uh, of, of very real, important uh, engagement. Uh, it's a case of have more planning staff. Now, Mr Mayor, there's far more in here, and it's like, well, we've got an item on the, the Council agenda, and we'll, we'll throw in a cut to the Area Committee's budget, and we'll come back to that uh, in a further amendment. But uh, for the time being, what we're proposing is, yes, we have a centralised planning committee, and that is like the old Development Management Committee, uh, uh, and, and it takes over the planning issues that are currently referred to policy resources. Um, it does not negate what was decided at the previous council meeting. Uh, it fits in with that and it allows us to go forward sensibly and return <coughs> the crucial engagement of local people with the planning process, not throw everything out, baby with the bathwater, as is proposed by the Conservatives. I move. Thank you, Councillor. Before I bring <coughs> Councillor Moody, um, uh, Philip, I think, wants to just uh, mention the procedure. Um, I have to advise the, the Council that this amendment is out of order. Uh, the decision taken at the annual Council meeting was clear that earlier committees would no longer be responsible for planning matters and that a planning committee be established to deal with those matters. Uh, this amendment would rescind that and we cannot rescind the decision of the council within six months. Mr Mayor, <coughs> um, I would point out through standing orders that this is not saying that we should not set up a planning committee. Um, it is agreeing to set up a planning committee um, it's the way in which it operates that is a question and I would contend that this does not negate the decision of the annual council meeting. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Dickman. Can I just listen to what Philip's comment responses to what Councillor Dickman said in the last week? Well, I think it does negate it because it clearly says that early committees will no longer be responsible for planning matters. This amendment has them continue to deal with the majority of planning matters. And it's clearly against that. It's rescinding that decision taken by the Council only two months ago. <coughs> Mr Mayor, can I suggest an alternative and seek <coughs> Philip's guidance on that then? <coughs> the, the decision of the Council in May was that, and I'll check the minutes, and it says that planning functions will be taken away from early committees. And that can't be touched for six months, can it not? So, Mr Mayor, what I'm going to suggest is an amendment, and I just want to, before I fall the table, just seek Philip's guidance through you, if that's okay, is that does the council then have the power to set up a subcommittee and give that subcommittee the powers to review the, the, the planning for committee's uh, terms of reference and then make a decision on behalf of the council? certainly have the power to set up a working group or a subcommittee to look at the working arrangements which are set out in here and then bring those back to the council. But the, the subcommittee cannot be given delegated powers by the council. And my understanding is they can. Well, I would suggest that on a matter as important as this to everybody, <coughs> it should come back to the full council. 
Right, well, through you, Mr. Mayor, that's your suggestion for the case. There's nothing that's against the rules that forbids that, is there? No, that, that, that is not rescinding the previous no. decision, so okay. it, it will be legitimate. Yeah. Okay. So, Chairman, um, sorry, Mr. Mayor, can I then suggest an, uh, an alternative amendment and just seek whether Council Whit would accept <coughs> that and possibly perhaps the amendment may support it? Is something along the lines of, and the wording can be worked out if you have a five minute recess, that, uh, that the Council delegates the decision in terms of the, the functions of the planning committee uh, to a subcommittee consisting of two Labour councillors, two Liberal Democrats, and two Conservatives, and that that subcommittee be given authority to make a decision on behalf of the council. My, my understanding is that that's not against the rules. Philip may not like it, or the leader of council may not like it, but I'm just suggesting that. And if, if that's not illegal, then I'm tabling it. Yeah, if, if you're setting up a committee or subcommittee, it's got to be politically balanced. Uh, council can suspend standing orders to... No, to it, it can't suspend the political balance of the they, they are a legal provision. <coughs> and, uh, does that a proposal? Well, if Philip is saying, can I suggest that there's a ten minute recess through you, Mr. Beck, for group leaders to have a discussion amongst themselves or uh, with at least two groups, and then something is uh, run by the presenter of the council being convened. So otherwise yeah. we'll be still I think, um, as uh, Philip has said, uh, this is obviously quite an important matter, and I think it might assist everybody if we do have a short recess uh, to have a discussion. But before I do that, I think Councillor Ahmed wants to speak, so I'll have, we'd be interested to what Councillor Ahmed's doing. Yeah, yeah, totally agree with you that it is an important uh, decision, which is why it should be the full council making a decision and not a subcommittee. That is the norm, that's how we operate. <coughs> On one hand, we're talking about the democratic process. And, and the claims that how undemocratic a planning committee is and powers being taken away from area committees. And let's, we're hearing yet, the subcommittee <coughs> will make the decision on behalf of the council. Mm. Make your own minds up. Thank you, Councillor Armand. So I think, unless there's anyone, anyone that wants to speak, I think we do have a, a, a 10 minute short recess uh, to convene and see if there's anything that can be done. Yeah, so if you have a time, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor. I'm happy to host uh, the leader if you want to, Councillor Wick. Take a vote. Yeah, so. <coughs> yeah, that's fine. So, 10 minutes, thank you. <coughs>
So a working group doesn't have to be clear. Yeah. 
Is going to move the working group on the basis that we discussed. Um, my group is happy to support that, so currently you know, we've got the, yeah. the numbers in the chair. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, fine. Yep. Okay. Um, Decisions because those decisions, the local um, decision making process will be taken away from, from uh, the, the, these people and the residents. The current area committee system is very democratic, which involves and engages with local people. Many of these residents attend council meetings to express their views and you know uh, whether that's in, in favour or against. The area committee allows you to help residents with proposals that may be small in scale but very important really important to them, whether that's family-wise, economically, or well-being-wise. But this new planning system will have detrimental effect on the current democratic process. It is, it is very rigid in, in, in its setup in the local decision-making um, decision process. And it will significantly cut, again it's been touched on, but it will significantly cut the local area committee budget uh, for projects that are very much needed in local areas. It will pretty much create like a postcode lottery on planning process uh, at a local level and, and, and we, we can't have that uh, in Pendle. It will create more inequality in the planning process. 
Mr. Mayor, I, I, what I will move is that a working group is set up of two, two, two. Um, obviously, that will report back to this full council, and it will be a full council that will make the final decision. Um, the final detail and you know the, 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 the terms of reference that, that you know we need to uh, agree on. Thank, Thank you, Councillor Mahmood. Do you have a second for that uh, um, amendment? Um, I'm happy to second that, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I won't go through the arguments. Um, I will call for a recorded vote. Do we have any other speakers? <coughs> Sorry, Councillor Gordon. I would just like to observe that I am highly amused that the people that do preaching about democracy have chosen to have a working group composed of two-thirds of the actual opposition of the council. Oh. So the people of Pendle did not vote two-thirds for the opposition, yet when they get the opportunity, the people who talk so much about defending the rights of Pendle residents lose <coughs> to have it composed in that manner. There is an irony, I feel. Councillor Iqbal. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I'm also highly amused that um, had the Conservatives thrown on a manifesto of what they were going to do at the end of council meeting, maybe the results of the elections would have been different. Um, but it's, it's ironic that Councillor Corbyn Price stands up and tries to preach to the rest of us in terms of uh, democratic accountability, yet <coughs> she was the one who accused uh, at a planning, uh, not planning, sorry, policy and resources committee meeting not so long ago, of people who put hands in for a certain thing have been criminal. Yeah, um, sure. That was recorded, Mr. Mayor, so she can't deny that. Mm. But the fact is, Mr. Mayor, the, the original process at the annual council meeting was steamrolled through by the Conservatives. There was no public consultation, no <coughs> engagement with any other political groups on the council. And whenever the council has been hung in the past, even when there used to be a Liberal Democrat majority a long time ago, uh, there used to be consensus and discussion with group leaders. None of that has happened under this Conservative leadership. So if the Conservative and Council Coleman Price need to learn about democratic accountability, maybe she needs to be part of the working group and she'll learn a few lessons there. <laughs> Council Tom. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I'd like to support Councillor David Whip's uh, position for an end vote. Um, I think a working group is fair and balanced. It's not a decision-making body. It's just to uh, discuss, um, and ultimately it will be the council's decision, and therefore the makeup of the working group does not have a bearing on the council's final decision making. Thank you, Councillor Wick. Any other speakers? No, so we have a second. <coughs> oh, sorry. Chair, uh, Mr. Mayor, we've uh, had this uh, discussion at the uh, last uh, full, uh, council meeting in terms of. The councillors have the ability to, to speak and represent their residents. Councillors will continue to have that right. So I think I don't think it's right to say councillors will not have the ability to speak and represent their residents. Uh, and in terms of local councillors having local knowledge, it's no different to the powers which policy and resources committee have in terms of planned applications which come before that committee, which is a politically balanced uh, committee, councillors from across the borough sit in that committee, and are we then saying the decisions of the policy and resources committee uh, are not right, are not fair? Uh, I don't think we would be saying that, and I don't think any councillors would say that. So <coughs> this planning committee would be no different to that process where councillors from across the borough would represent Pendle not a particular area, but represent the <coughs> as a whole, because we have one plan policy, and that's the policy of Pendle Council, not policy of Nelson, not policy of Bagford, Corn, or one of those It's one policy. And that's what we're trying to do, is have uh, consistent decision-making uh, by this plan committee, and that's the purpose of it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ahmed. Uh, no other speakers. So we've got a second there for a name vote on the amendment. Uh, but we have a vote on the amendment <coughs> that's, that's Councillor Lewis. <coughs> sorry, Councillor Lamoon's amendment. If you follow the amendment, please say for. If you're against, please say against. If you wish to abstain, please say abstain. So, Councillor Adman? For. Councillor Ahmed? For. Councillor Ahmed? Against. Councillor Ahmed Sanchez? 
For Councillor Alvey. Against Councillor Alley. For Councillor Anna. For Councillor Anwar. For Councillor Ashraf. For Councillor Aslan. Against Councillor Butterworth. Against Councillor Carroll. Against Councillor Church. For Councillor David Colburn Price. Mm. Against <coughs> Councillor Sarah Colburn Price. Against Councillor Kulfor. Against Councillor Hani. For Councillor Mohammed Iqbal. For what? Councillor Yasser Iqbal. For Councillor Khalid. Against Councillor Lord. For Councillor McGregory. Against Councillor McGowan. Against Councillor Mahmood. For Councillor Newman. For Councillor Purcell. Against Councillor Salter. Against Councillor Stone. Against Councillor Sutcliffe. Against Councillor David Wick. For Councillor Tom Wick. For with any reasons oh. and, <laughs> and that parish and town councils yeah. are able to request that an application go before committee yeah. that in accordance with established council protocols meetings of the planning committee are not held on Wednesdays that meetings of the planning committee be peripatetic and held routinely at venues across the borough that the frequency of area committees be retained on a monthly frequency. Yes. That area committees are allowed to comment on plan application. This is uh, going with the um, uh, annual meeting proposition. And finally, that area committee budgets be maintained at 170,000 and continue to be apportioned according to the electorate of each area committee. Now there's quite a lot there, uh, Mr Mayor, and Jane will be grateful for the fact that I can email her, uh, this through. Um, in terms of the first part, the uh, issue that seemed to exercise the Conservatives was a council asking for an application to go before committee not needing to have any reasons and the explanation of that is that at the moment any request for a committee consideration is before any of the planning process has gotten away it's right at the beginning and we won't have the planning uh, issues before us it'll be a case of well this is an important issue in that area and it's worthy of committee considering it. So therefore, that's why you go to committee. It's not a planning argument. It's not a, well, we don't agree with that decision, so it's good for me. <coughs> it's a, this is an important issue. It needs to be considered by committee rather through, than through the delegation scheme. Um, in terms of not holding the meetings on Wednesday, <coughs> this council has a long-held protocol that Wednesdays are left free for other organisations to hold meetings and um, uh, I mean my suggestion would be if we have a planning committee that it meets on the Thursday but for instance the second Wednesday in every month and it's a key issue for three of this, this bench uh, all conflict with 
uh, Barnswick Town Council. I'm not suggesting you lose control them that way, but you know, uh, conspiracy theorists will have their way. Um, uh, that if any changes do come into play, that the monthly uh, area committee meetings are retained and not uh, uh, watered down so that they meet every other month. And that whatever the outcome of this uh, process is, that the area committees at least be able to comment on planning applications as they can at the moment in regard of major applications of 60 or more counties. And then the final bit is about the, the budget, where this has been slipped into this report tonight um, to cut the budget uh, from 170,000 to less than 100,000 pounds. And the impact of that, looking for the uh, correct piece of paper, is that Barrefoil and Western Parishes would lose in the order of seven and a half thousand pounds, Coleman District over sixteen thousand pounds, Nelson, Bryfield and Reedley over thirty two thousand pounds, and West Craven fourteen thousand six hundred and ninety one pounds. So um, there may be an argument uh, or a discussion to be had about whether the uh, part of that budget should be revenue versus capital, but the working group can look at that as well as the other issues uh, that will be in front of it. So um, the investment that is made by area committees is quite crucial. This is a cut to some of the most important local issues and proposals that come forward in local areas uh, by the Conservatives by the back door. This item isn't about cutting area committee budgets, but it's been usurped by the Conservative administration to try <coughs> and do it on the quiet so that nobody notices and it has that awful impact of cutting £71,000 uh, out of the local investment that should be being made. Um, Mr Mayor, um, I uh, would move this. Uh, we can uh, think about the capital revenue split um, in due course. Uh, I think there is merit in having some revenue at the area committees, but uh, uh, you know, let's uh, consider that in due course if that's sensible. Um, I move. <coughs> Do you have a second of that? Any other speakers? Councillor Witt. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, in the initial uh, motion, um, as on the pink sheet, the leader of the council referred to the £3,000 per councillor and that this would be £3,000 for each councillor to spend. Mr Mayor, I am aghast at that comment. And I think that the leader should rescind this. It is not £3,000 for each councillor to spend. It is um, the money of the people of Pendle raised through council tax. And it should be the decision of every committees to spend that money, not individual councillors. Good ideas, and there might be some good projects, but please. 
please use them. But that council is already undergoing a review of its capital programme in order to take a responsible approach to the amount of borrowing it has and the amount of that costs. It costs the council a fortune. And as part of the transformation, to come up with a, a professional and efficient council, this is the sort of thing we have to address. And we as councils have to play our part in doing that as well. So that's why the proposal is there for a reduced overall total so it can be used more flexibly and more efficiently by all of us on behalf of our residents. <coughs> Concerns which Council Whip himself and the Council <coughs> mentioned in this Council Chamber that the committee previously, in a, in a similar format, used to sit for many, many hours, that will happen. That's what we're trying to avoid to make the system more efficient, uh, more speedy, and come to decision making uh, in, a, in a smooth, uh, orderly manner. And clearly, if councillors have a, 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 an option to call in the planning up without any valid planning reason, uh, we, we can see what's going to happen. Uh, and in terms of the point that's made about, about the planning department and this, the staff, this report is fully supported by our planning manager. And if we really want to support <coughs> our staff and our planning department, we should be supporting them. This is with the support of our planning department and, and Neil Watson. And this is the right thing to do. We all know it's the right thing to do. But whether we choose to do that is a different matter. Thank you, Councillor McLaren. Do you want to say something? Just, just to counter that, I'm not sure what the council was asking me for everything that he read there to go to the working group. Okay, can I just make a point for you? Was Councillor Allen not wrapping up the debate? I, I did have my hand up at the same time, so perhaps. Yeah, I'd like to speak to that. Well, doesn't matter. So I'm just wondering if, if Council would could just very quickly clarify whether or not. This uh, amendment to go into working group or for a decision right now because I wasn't sure. Mr. Mayor, I intend responding to the debate, so I'll pick that up. Well, Councillor Lewitt, I'll allow you to respond. Um, to take that one uh, first, this is the resolution of the Council. Uh, these will be decisions of the Council and uh, given for the working group to, come, uh, to consider. Um, once these decisions are passed tonight, if they are passed, then uh, it, they cannot be challenged for six months. Um, six months rule applies both ways. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, um, Councillor Ahmed says that these proposals have the support of the planning manager. But where has been the support for the planning manager for the last 18 months? when the planning department has been overrun by application after application after application and the staff have not been appointed to properly deal with those applications. 
Why has <coughs> Mr Watson had to work all hours and his staff working all hours to deal with the number of applications that they've got? Is the administration aware that at one stage each uh, planning officer had 70 <coughs> planning <coughs> applications on their books, each and every one of them, 70, and what on earth did the administration do about putting things in place? Was there any appointment of any temporary uh, locums, any consultants to, to help get through that, that log jam of applications? No, there wasn't. Was there any support uh, to actually employ people or retain people? No, there wasn't. The problem lies not with the political processes. Well, yeah, there is a big problem with the physical process. We want <coughs> useless administration. But the problem lies with the political administration not giving the resources and allocating the resources to a part of the council that uh, was and is under severe pressure. That's the bottom, top and the bottom of it. Yeah. You should have got your hand in your pocket, you look at the figures and you see there's a massive underspend in the planning expenditure and it's because on the <coughs> one hand there were massive uh, fees coming in from the multitude of planning applications and on the other hand you weren't <coughs> employing the staff to actually deal with them. That's the root and branch uh, approach that you should have taken and you didn't. And instead, you're going down the route of destroying or wanting to go down the route of destroying local democracy. This amendment tonight is intended to try and mitigate the worst aspects of uh, your uh, uh, wishes. And uh, no doubt, we'll come back to another council meeting. You might have the, the votes in the council chamber on that night. I mean, first rule of politics, make sure you've got the votes. You've got a council meeting, you haven't got all your members here. Well, you know, you read what you saw. Um, Councillor David Corbyn Price, Councillor David Corbyn Price, uh, said, well, you know, uh, give each council £3,000. What an iniquitous way of dealing with it. Where is the equity when some parts of Pendle have more residents and the way that those allocations have been uh, allocated across the borough in the past have been based on the population, uh, the electorate, which is a proxy for the population because we can, we can measure that. <coughs> so why would you seek to disadvantage, and I'll quote West Crazy, because your proposal, mm -hmm. Councillor Corbyn Price, will disadvantage the West Australian <coughs> uh, people, the population, <coughs> by over a thousand pounds. And uh, <coughs> if you think that's fair, well, I'm sorry, but uh, you've got another thing coming. Um, and then you say that the spending of this money is not taking place. Well, Councillor Iqbal picked up one point in the fact that programmes are in place, and I know from the area committee that I serve on, that money is allocated, uh, for instance, to the uh, renewal of dog waste and litter bins. And it's there for to be called down. It may not be used in any one financial year, uh, but it's still there and it's topped up. Same with uh, shop front grants, topped up as necessary. But when it comes, I can only speak about the Australian Area Committee. Um, uh, spend money, invest, town square in Bali, good example, but it's taken three years. Thank you, um, Mr. Mayor, I hope Thank that you. this will have unanimous Thank you, Councillor Lee. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, um, point of order, point of order. Disrespect, disrespect yes. over here. Yes. Um, Mr. Mayor, I have a point of order. No, Mr. My, Mayor, my brother, Mr. point of order. Mr. One person standing at a time. Council will be on to you. Mr. Mayor, one person to stand at a time. I think we're going to move on to the vote now. Mr. Mayor, I'm talking about disrespect. 
same thing until certain people get to the right answer, the answer they're looking for. Is that, is that the purpose of it? That isn't the purpose of the polling procedure. Having said that, the uh, next year when we go back to the executive uh, system, uh, the procedure will be different in terms of the, and the scrutiny committee. So until that time, this polling procedure will stay, but I think what the purpose of the polls will look, is it sensible? 
second for that comes uh, for that motion. I'll second. Thank you, Councillor Thornton. Councillor Witt. Mr. Mayor, our group will simply be voting against this. Um, it, there's very little change to the current process um, uh, except that you know, further reasons have to be given. <coughs> I think it's a tribute to the way this council operates that over 45 meetings of the Policy and Resources Committee there have only been 14 occasions when uh, items have been called in um, and, and uh, re-discussed because of uh, various factors depending on, on circumstances. And in a lot of the cases where there has been that further discussion, there has been a better outcome for uh, the people affected. And I can think of one or two recently, but I won't go into details. So, although this report isn't uh, making any significant proposals in terms of change, <coughs> it may be that uh, an unscrupulous uh, controlling group would seek to use uh, you know, any uh, further the, uh, little bits to ensure that uh, there wasn't proper scrutiny during the remaining term of their administration. Uh, so uh, we will simply vote against it and we'll keep the existing system, which is more or less what is being proposed anyway. Thank you, Councillor Iqbal. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr Mayor. Uh, Mr Mayor, as the report says on point um, number four, obviously the committee system has been in place for over four years now. I think we can count on hand, one hand collectively how many decisions have been repeated for the second meeting going to policy resources. You know, I want to congratulate Councillor David Ogden because there's been a couple of callings that I've been part of to where he's attended on behalf of the leader and he's been up front to say, look, I'm a new councillor and sometimes he may not have been aware of the previous issues and you know, credit to him for actually coming to the calling meeting. The, the leader is expected, the group leaders are expected to attend that calling meeting and unfortunately uh, Councillor Med, for whatever reason, has been missing on a couple of occasions and has had to ask colleagues to step in, but I'm surprised why the report has actually made it, because if in effect, as Councillor Ahmed is saying, nothing's changing, then why waste Mr Mosdale's valuable time in preparing the report if nothing's going to change? I mean, the, the recommendation is uh, that the calling is appropriate and the teacher is consistent and transparent. Is he saying that group leaders don't have that ability? Uh, because certainly the meetings that I've previously chaired in terms of calling for the meetings that I've attended with Kath Robin, as I keep referring to, has attended a couple. Uh, there's been a, a frank and open and honest debate between the group leaders or their substitute, uh, and that's gone back to committee. And some of the decisions have actually changed because there's been an acknowledgement from the administration, whoever it is the administration is, that maybe things should be different. And I'll cite one example that the lorry park at Van Oswick, there was a, a strong debate at Policy Resources Committee with some colleagues uh, ridiculing other colleagues, saying that they were basically uh, wasting people's time. But when it went to the calling, the county council had a change of heart, and that calling procedure actually allowed something positive to be done. So there are positives to the calling process, and uh, I, I won't be supporting the recommendation because, in effect, there's nothing changing, Mr. Mayor. I think it's an insult to group leaders uh, if you're actually saying that they need to be more transparent. Thank you, Councillor. Any other speakers? No, so we have a, a, a motion and second. Can we uh, show of hands of all those in favour of the motion? Fifteen for and all those against. That's sixteen against. So that uh, fails. Um, moving on then to agenda item number ten. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Again, uh, this report is we've seen a good example this evening why it needs to be a tank of uh, the rules of procedure. Perfect example. We have it every four council meeting where and we're talking about respect for uh, uh, other people, and there's a genuine reason why the council realities are here, and I find it really disrespectful 
the point made by Councillor Whip, um, do be disappointed with that comment um, about the power of the OMT. Um, in terms of showing the respect for the members, where the respect for the Mayor? We're talking about the colleagues. The Mayor is asking Councillor Whip to stop speaking, to sit down. Did Councillor Whip stop for one second? No. Continued, just does what he likes as, as, as per normal. And that's the reason why the system needs to be tightened up. And it applies to all, all, all groups. I'm not saying Councillor Whip is just a problem, there's other people have done on occasions. And we should be doing And we should, if, given this as a point of uh, clarification, point of order, the Mayor needs to be asked, the point of order, he will then make a ruling on it. And whatever the ruling is, has to be final. We might not like the Mayor's decision, but we have to accept it. And that's what this report is doing. I'm hoping Council will accept it if they don't <coughs> clearly they just want to continue behaving in the normal way that they do. Thank you, Councillor Ahmed. Do you have a second, Councillor? Yeah, I'd like to apologise to you, Mayor. But not for my Thank you, Mr. Mayor. First of all, I have not referred to Councillor Leonte. Um, I sympathise very much uh, for his circumstances. Um, uh, the Conservative group of two members missing. I have no knowledge whatsoever of why uh, Councillor, the other Councillor Bradbury, is not here, but uh, he's not here. Um, Mr. Mayor, in terms of the uh, proposals to change, which are set out in paragraphs 15, 16, and 17, um, my group is of the view that uh, the first two bullet points in paragraph 15 are adequate. Um, uh, the first one is respect the chair at all times. And the second one is adhere to the Council Code of Conduct. And the Council Code of Conduct would appear to cover the um, further three bullet points in paragraph 15. And I'm, I'm, I'm at a bit of a loss. I mean, I, I think some of the English is, is, is clumsy here. But I, I'm at a loss as to understand that have a responsibility to secure to secure good conduct on the part of all councillors and of their political group. Now, I'm not sure what influence Councillor Beneath has upon Councillor Sutcliffe in terms of a responsibility to secure good conduct or what influence <coughs> Councillor McGladry, Kieran McGladry, has on, say, Councillor Safar Ali uh, to ensure that he uh, 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 secures good conduct. So I, I, I'm just, I think it's a nonsense to suggest that individual councillors have a responsibility for how the other 32 Re respond and and, and um, act. Uh, I just don't think it's a sensible way to to set things out. Um, and as I say, this is covered insofar as it can be covered within the council code of conduct. So you're sort of repeating some of the bits in the council code of conduct within um, uh, uh, the further bullet points. In paragraph 16, it says, with the permission of the mayor, a member may make a point of personal explanation. Now, in order to make a point of personal explanation, you would have to explain what that personal explanation was. So, how on earth the mayor could rule as to whether personal explanation point of personal explanation could be given or not without having heard what the point of personal explanation is. I'm not quite sure. Um, and, and I think that's a bit of a nonsense. The, uh, it is uh, the case that people have sought to make points of personal explanation which have not related to misinterpretation of what they've said 
in a debate previously, and that's the narrow way in which the current uh, sounding orders are set out, and, and that seems fine to me. And then in paragraph 17, it says um, that the, you know, you've got to state what number point of, order, point of order it is, and, and fair enough. So, uh, in the light of that, Mr. Mayor, I would propose an amendment that deletes um, the final three bullet points within paragraph 15, deletes the revision to rule 14.11 as set out in paragraph 16, um, and accepts the uh, 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 proposal in paragraph 17. So it's deleted three bullet points in paragraph 15, the, fact that the, the bottom three there, leaving, respecting the chair and the date of the Council for the Conduct, and then deleting the written order with the point of personal explanation. Thank you, Councillor Whitton. You're a second up for that amendment. Mr. Mayor, I'll, I'll second that. Um, I think the Code of Conduct does adequately express what all councillors um, are deemed to adhere to. Um, and so saying that it should adhere to the Code of Conduct, I think, is enough. Um, I also agree that um, 16, uh, with the point of personal explanations, is onerous. Um, you would then first have to, um, with the Mayor, um, in open debate, explain why the personal explanation is needed for them to rule if it's admissible first, and then also give the point of explanation. Um, when in actuality, the reasons for giving the point of personal explanation and in getting the great mayor's agreement, you will already have expressed that personal explanation. And therefore, it makes the whole thing um, a bit of a rigmarole that's seemed unnecessary. Um, and again, as Councillor David Whip said, um, Order. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Yeah, Councillor Nicholson. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I just think, it's, to try and be constructive, I mean, there'll be another occasion where I fall out with fellow councillors in this chair, and, for example, I might seem to attack Councillor Ahmed on point of politics, but I think the one thing that we, we need to take outside the chair is that when we go outside, I should be happy to talk to Councillor Ahmed, and I am, and vice versa, some other colleagues as well. I think generally the, the, the rule of debate in this chair is far better than other council chairs that I've seen. And I know we've got guests from another council. I'm sure if, if we chose to visit their council, we'd be uh, you know, completely timid as councillors compared to some of the meetings that go on in other councils at the moment. But just in terms of trying to reach a consensus, I'm just wondering whether between councillors Ahmed and Councillor Weaver they, they can agree, because there's no, I don't think there's any point in an amendment being tabled if there's consensus that we can agree. But I think the councillor's code of conduct is something that all councillors should read. And uh, I can't genuinely remember the last time I read it, so I'll be the first one to hold my hand up. And maybe that's something for officers to pick up or group leaders to pick up and make sure that the councillors read the code of conduct before they come to certainly the full council meeting, uh, where it's very sometimes confrontational. But in terms of adhering to that, I think if every council read the code of conduct, then some, maybe they wouldn't have the political argument that sometimes we do. But I think what's, what's what would be helpful, uh, Mr. Mayor, is that in terms of respecting the chair at all times, I agree with that. The second bullet point, the Code of Conduct, I think covers them bullets point three and four. <coughs> but I don't think there's any harm in uh, just repeating for the sake of repeating that we refrain from attacking each other. There's nothing wrong with having a, a political debate, and I don't think anybody can <coughs> disagree that, because that's what we're all elected to do. But when it boils over into personal attacks, I think that's possible. the line. Um, but once we walk outside the chamber, I think we should all be civil human beings. And generally, I think the cross panel we always have been uh, since I've been on the council. But in terms of the point of personal explanation, I agree with what Council Luther said, because if I stand up to seek your permission, I'm in effect saying what the point of personal explanation is, simply to seek your permission to say mm -hmm. it anyway. So I think that's, that doesn't need to be there, Mr. Mayor. And then in terms of the point of order again, I think that's covered in the Code of Conduct. But I know Councillor Sutcliffe and Purcell will be our council role club, but the county council recently issued like a, a handy sheet to all county councillors that said that when you're at council meetings, it gives you the actual point from the constitution that you can speak. And sometimes I'm as guilty as anybody else that I'll say I want to raise a point of order and councillor Sarah Cogworth, right, might say which number. 
or can't be around long enough to remember which number book. So a lot of new cats will watch. And I think if they have that key, they can refer to that. You can make the ruling as the mayor, whether it is a value point of um, order, Mr. Mayor. But I think generally this is a plea <coughs> to all cats. I think there needs to be some consensus tonight, rather than being pitted against each other, because that's not healthy for, for debate. So maybe if Councillor Romney wants to accept what Councillor would be saying with that addition of the bullet point at the bottom, I think that covers all the posts. Then. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, in terms of uh, paragraph 15, uh, happy to accept the amendment, respect the chair at all times, adhere to the council court of conduct. In terms of uh, number 16, I think the purpose or the intention of this is to avoid people just standing up and speaking. So people couldn't stand up and say, a point of personal experience. I think the point this paragraph is making is, Philip's read the report, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that if someone wants to make a point of personal explanation, you need to stand up and say, Mr. Mayor, I have a point of personal explanation. And if Mr. Mayor will say, yes, what is your point of personal explanation? Then he can explain, or she can explain. That's the purpose of it, rather than people just standing up willy-nilly, because that's what happens. You have one councillor speaking, and another person say, that's not a point of personal explanation, and kicks off. And that's what we're trying to avoid. And I think this is perfectly reasonable and I think it's just how you read it. That's my interpretation. I think that's the intention behind this. Um, and I'm sure Philip will agree with me. That's, that's, <coughs> the, that's the intention of this. It's just so councillors are going through the mayor before they start making the point of personal explanation. So once the mayor says, yes, you may speak, then that councillor can then make their point. And I think that's per perfectly reasonable. Uh, I wouldn't want that to be deleted. I want that to be retained. And I'm sure Councillor Rick now understands the purpose and intention of what he's saying, and I'm sure he'll agree with me. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ahmed. Uh, Councillor Rick, you've got the final say on the. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would just lead him through the, the standing orders in order to understand fully the uh, standing orders. Sorry, it's a joke. <laughs> yeah, read them and understand them. Yes. Far out. Um, Mr. Mayor, um, I, I think there was a suggestion, I know there was a suggestion from uh, Councillor Iqbal that we retain the <coughs> final bullet point in, in paragraph 15. And I think Councillor Ahmed um, uh, was content to lose that one. No, that's fine. I'll, I'll leave that in. Okay, all right. So uh, I think if it uh, ensures unanimity, that uh, I'm happy to withdraw the deletion of the final bullet point in paragraph 15. Um, but in, in, in paragraph 16, <coughs> I think this really needs a bit more work because uh, if you look at the standing orders, uh, uh, paragraph 14.4 says. Uh, when a member may speak again. Um, uh, and the Roman numeral uh, 6 there says, a member who has spoken on a motion may not speak again um, except, and uh, there's a few uh, exceptions, by way of personal <coughs> explanation. So, in, in reality, what happens is, um, somebody says something and uh, somebody elsewhere in the chamber <coughs> stands up and says, point of personal explanation, Mr Mayor, that is not what I said, or that is not what I meant. Something of that order. And at that point, any speaker other than the point person trying to make the point of personal explanation should sit down in order for the personal explanation to be made. Now, if the point of personal explanation speaker has to explain to the mayor why it's a point of personal explanation in order for the mayor to give permission, then it sort of undermines the whole process. Um, you know, I stood up, point of personal explanation, Mr. Mayor. Um, I did not say X, Y, Z, 
Um, and then you rule, yes, you can make a point of personal explanation. But I've already said it. So I'm not sure what role or uh, what the, the, the impact of rule 14.11 um, uh, would be. So that's why I'm proposing that we take it out, because I, I, I just don't think it is necessary. If the current standing orders are followed, they are adequate to cover the point that Councillor Ahmed made. Um, if it isn't a point of personal explanation, the Mayor says, thank you, it's not a point of personal explanation, sit down. <coughs> Thank you, Councillor Wick. So we've got a mover and a seconder for the amendment. We took a vote on the amendment first. Uh, can we show hands of all those in favour?
think uh, he's, he's told me what he's, he's going to do after the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's the secret which I've let out to everybody. <laughs> Um, so I've been a counselor for seven years and I've seen the hard work that Philip does. He's, uh, I think everyone would agree, a powerhouse of knowledge. Every time I've asked him a question, he's never said, I'm not sure about this answer. He's always got the answer at the tip of his tongue. Um, and uh, I think that he will be a hard act to follow. Uh, he, he told me just before the meeting that he joined his council in 1986. Uh, that was the year I was born. In fact, he started, <laughs> <laughs> so he started one month before uh, I was born. So that's a, a, literally a lifetime that he's been in the council. So uh, can I, uh, on behalf of the council and behalf of everyone here, and all those that have gone before, uh, our, before us, that uh, Philip, thank you for the service that you've given to Pendle, to Pendle Council, and we wish you uh, a very happy and long retirement whatever that may be, and obviously <laughs> let the cat out of the bag now what your return <laughs> plans are, but um, we wish you a very happy time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just following on from yourself, uh, I'm sure the other group we do want to speak as well. Uh, just want to put on record on behalf of the Council uh, how grateful we are for all the services and all the dedication over the many, many years uh, that you've served at Pendle Council and worked extremely hard for the knowledge. I think that's the outstanding thing for me, is, is, as Mr Mayor said, is whenever I've needed information or needed some clarification or <coughs> guidance, is go to Philip and you'll get the answer. Yeah, always get the answer and so really grateful. We're going to be really missed uh, is Philip because once we've had uh, various members of staff, uh, senior members of staff who have left and when they leave they take the knowledge with them and I think that's a real loss for us as Pendle and it's going to take some uh, time to find that gap and, and that uh, knowledge and we'll probably need Philip uh, on occasion, I'm sure we're going to get stuck and we'll have to give Philip a call and say look, where's this and how we found this out, so thank you very much Philip for all your service, thank you. Sorry, Councillor before. Councillor Nick, Councillor. Councillor Mahmood. Councillor Mahmood. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I echo you know, what you have just said and also the leader has said. Um, Philip has given an outstanding service uh, over the years. <coughs> And he's given his strategic leadership to this council, and that's you know being a staff in, in many ways. I would call him the walking encyclopedia, um, full of knowledge. I think because I've touched on that, he's full of knowledge. He has the answer for everything, especially also local government, but especially the, the legal aspect uh, of local government. <coughs> Probably one of the few uh, legal gurus or walking encyclopedia that we have in the whole country. So yeah. Thank you very much for everything over the years and all the best and happy retirement. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, I joined this council in 1998, but I first came across Philip uh, as a teenager in 1988, and he was one of the reasons that I came into politics. And I won't share what the reason was, but he was at a committee meeting where I came without a planning application, ironically. Uh, <laughs> And Philip's view was different to mine at the time, and I thought I'd need to get into politics, and lo and behold, ten years later, I got elected. But, Mr. Mayor, I think it's been the voice of calmness. I mean, you can judge at every council meeting the amount of pressure that he's under from the likes of meeting other councillors, but you never see Philip lose his right. That's, that's a rare commodity in council offices in this day and age. That some of them, you can tell when they've lost the right, but Philip will see the same expression no matter what's going on inside his head. But I think Philip has been a loyal servant of this program. And it's unique that he spent all his career working, most of his career working in Pendle, because no doubt he's had opportunities to move on elsewhere, but he's chosen to live in the borough and work in the borough as well. And I think that's a, a commitment and a testament to his loyalty. <coughs> uh, he'll sadly be missed by, I think, all councillors that have either been before us, those that are here this evening, and those that will follow us in future years, because you can't get a Philip Mosdale just off the shelf. It takes 40 years of service to get him as well. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just looking around this council chamber, and I see.
see that we have six ex-mayors, a mayor and a deputy. Um, something that, oh, I forgot about you. <laughs> <laughs> to the, the city mayor and uh, I'm sure, you know, for deputies as well. He was always a, a great support to me. There's something that uh, tittled me the other week when I was talking to Philip about his retirement and he said, well, I'm going to carry on with Harvey Holmes. I said, but they only sit once a year. You know, so good luck with that one. But thank you so much, Philip, for for everything you've done, I'm, I'm just repeating what the people have said, but you, you, you will be missed and you will be a card out for thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Councillor Zafa Ali. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I, I would like to also echo uh, comments made around the room, but also with my other hat on as uh, uh, the former chair of, town, of the Town Council. I came into politics in 2015. Uh, I still remember uh, the first meetings I had with, with, with Philip, uh, they were very informative and for somebody who hadn't been in, in politics uh, before, having to deal with uh, transfer of services and, and lots of important decisions having to be made on obviously the town council level, uh, it was absolutely, um, I suppose, uh, selfless of Mr Moresdale to obviously take the time and effort to explain some of the ramifications that were coming about from certain decisions. And, and sort of helping me and my colleagues uh, along the way in making the decisions that we then did on, on the Town Council. He certainly will be a hard act to follow and uh, happy retirement, Philip. Councillor Whitby, you Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, of course, somebody uh, who was a councillor six years before uh, Philip um, uh, took up employment with Pendle Council, I am staggered that he is retiring. I mean, why would somebody who's only done that number of years uh, want to retire? But of course, um, Philip has, has, has attempted to uh, retire or partially retire um, uh, some time ago and uh, was, was uh, uh, around, around, around three days a week, I think it was. Uh, and then had to sort of step back up again. And I know he's been uh, wanting to, to, to reduce his uh, commitment and his, his work uh, for some time. Um, I'm delighted that he's finally been uh, able to, to sort of smash off those shackles and, and liberate himself and uh, uh, to, to uh, enjoy uh, the, the cells uh, actually not being uh, uh, shackled to that grindstone. But Philip will be missed desperately in terms of his organisational memory. And with, uh, what, a 36 year, uh, 36 year career in Pendle, his knowledge of the way that the council operates and uh, any discrete bits of um, arcane matters that may or may not ever come up again uh, is desperately invaluable <coughs> and I don't think people understand or appreciate just how much is lost to organisations when long serving members with all that information uh, in the back of their heads uh, leave and um, as someone who over the years has, has tapped up previous officers of Pendle Council or if I go back far enough previous officers of the predecessor uh, authorities um, and, and you know, found just how much uh, a knowledge they have and you know, you've got a problem in your ward and you go back and it might be something that is literally 50 years uh, old or even further and there might still be something out there that knows something about it because the dry <coughs> paper record doesn't necessarily reflect the whole of um, an organisation's knowledge. I think the other thing that this council will very much uh, miss uh, Philip for um, and <coughs> is the complaints department. 
and uh, all of us, perhaps, you know, will make a complaint about this or that or the other, or members of the public will make complaints, and uh, Philip will adjudicate and deal with things fairly, and uh, uh, I, I think that is a, an aspect of uh, Philip's role that it will be hard to, to replicate and um, clearly the special council meeting has got uh, new structures in place um, I think on both scores organisational knowledge and um, the, the sort of dealing with complaints that, that wasn't in those structures but it would be something that will leave a hold of this so on behalf of the Liberal Democrat group um, we would wish uh, Philip um, the very uh, most enjoyable retirement. Um, I do appreciate that, as with many other former <coughs> council officers, that Hartley Homes are a home for uh, retired member council employees. And although I'm not involved with Hartley Homes, I do occasionally see one or two people who are a blast from the past. And I look forward to seeing Philip as a blast from the past in the future. I don't think we have any other speakers, so if we... Uh... Mr. Mayor, isn't Mr. Monsdale not speaking? Thank you for all those very kind remarks. Um, it has been 36 years. Um, for the very most part of that, it's been very enjoyable. And... Um, I leave with uh, mixed feelings, um, but I think everybody realises that at some point the time arrives when you do need to be. And thank you for that time. Thank you. So, if we, uh, I think it was a coincidence that we. We've had that after the rules of procedure uh, <laughs> thing, everyone's quite hard on this, but anyway, we're going to do back to normal service then. Uh, agenda item number 12, uh, a councillor Whip. Yes, sorry, this one. Um, this motion is about street, street sweeping, Mr. Mayor. Um, council notes that street sweeping has been adversely affected by the reduction in mechanical sweepers being used in Pendle since April, with a firefighting approach being used in areas not now receiving regular sweeping. Council also notes that the proposed saving of £24,000 from the cut has not been achieved due to a £20,000 penalty liable uh, for the discontinuation of the contract for the mechanical sweeper. Council resolves that the budget for mechanical sweeping is reinstated, uh, that the previous sweeping routes and frequencies are restored. Mr Mayor, I, I, I move this. Uh, clearly, the Council debated it last uh, December, and the impact of this decision uh, came into effect in May. The Council voted to reduce the number of mechanical sweepers from five down to four. And um, I have to say, the last time that I went into the yard at Fleet Street, I found the fifth sweeper still there, but doing nothing. Um, the, the staffing had been reduced so that there were only four sweepers being employed, but actually we've still got the fifth sweeper. In the meantime, my inbox has been uh, uh, added to by a number of residents contacting me, and of course in West Craven, uh, from the West Craven part, but also from Folridge. And uh, people saying, well, we, we haven't seen a sweeper, and, and there's all this debris and detritus. They don't use those words. Uh, there's all this rubbish building up at the sides of the road. And uh, we used to see a sweeper regularly, but they don't come round anymore. And in Folridge, uh, <coughs> the sort of lady sort of 
sweeping outside her house and uh, complaining that uh, uh, you know she didn't see a sweeper anymore. Now, I raised this at the Policy and Resources Committee and uh, I quoted the example of Kelbrook where there are a spirited group of residents who are busy beavering away uh, uh, with civic pride initiatives, cleaning, sweeping, um, you know, getting rid of weeds and vegetation and things like that, and seeking to improve the village. And a resident, um, quite rightly, tackled me and said, well, you know, we're doing good things, but we haven't seen the sweeper. <coughs> so, I think the same has happened in Trone, um, and I can't go any further than that, but uh, my understanding of the situation is that various parts of the borough have, uh, the sweeping has been reduced, the, uh, the, the rounds have been changed, some areas continue to get a, a regular service uh, and other parts of the borough uh, don't get that regular service. And my understanding from the feedback that I've had from the service is that the four uh, mechanical sweeper uh, drivers are unable to get around the routes that they are expected to get around. And uh, some areas are literally being missed. So we've got quite a, 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 a poor erosion of the standard of service. We've got uh, a situation where the support saving isn't being achieved, so the £24,000 saving isn't there. At best, it's £4,000. But we've got a firefighting service where the sweepers are abstracted from the routes to go and cover the areas where they're going <coughs> went. And instead of having a, a, a reliable, regular service, we're, we're getting a rubbish service, pardon the use of that word. Now, this was touted as an efficiency. This is not an efficiency. This is a cut, a cut in standards. I'm very proud that 20 years ago, uh, we actually introduced the mechanical sweepers. It was on our watch, and uh, we introduced them uh, after we took control of it, of, of, of the council in the noughties, and it's something that has done this council proud. I move. Thank you. Councillor Lord. I'll second that. Thank you. Um, and all those years back, twenty-four years, did you say? I think I just yes. got on the council, and the council, the late councillor John David who some may know, some may not know, um, fought very, very hard for this service and also fought very, very hard to keep the funding there, to keep the service going. So it's, it's, it's quite sad that this has been cut like it has and it's making, it's having a, a detrimental effect on certain areas of Pendle. Um, it, it, it is sad, it is really sad when uh, when we were in administration then and we got this service going with John David of course, yeah. Um, so it's just a shame that it's just come to this. It's, uh, and you know, in Colm, we are a very windy town because we're high up and rubbish flows round and round and round and round and then it's not so windy you know, somebody will come along and pick it up, sweep it up with a sweeper um, so it's very very much needed and it needs to be reinstated <coughs> Thank you Councillor, I don't think we have any other speakers so we go to Councillor Double Fine I feel sorry for Dorothy because she's been misled really. I'm looking across at Councillor Mahmood and some of the Labour councillors who were in the room um, at PR because all of the reasoning behind any change to service was fully explained then. And the rest of you that weren't at PR have not had the benefit of hearing what the
the explanation was, um, which was entirely to do with the shortage of drivers and nothing at all to do with this cut. So if I may, I could just read you a little from a letter from Mr. Walker, who of course is head of this service. We introduced revised street cleansing schedule in April of this year. The frequency of cleansing has been amended from simply following the waste and recycling teams to a schedule which now allows us to deliver a service based on the needs of the area. We are mindful that these changes may, may change due to seasonal variances such as leaf fall and we will review the level of resources at such times. This review gave us the opportunity to reduce the resources deployed on street cleansing, yet it still enabled us to deliver service on a weekly basis into areas of greater need. The remaining areas are either visited fortnightly or on a full weekly basis and this has enabled us in the main to continue visiting a street the day after a scheduled collection. The scheme was designed like this because we were conscious that we had communicated on such a schedule to our residents in the past and members have been keen to keep the service running in this way when we spoke to them at budget working group meetings and in previous years when proposing cuts to the street cleansing service. I'm concerned about the lights, I know that most people aren't. The service has impacted, uh, has been impacted on initially by COVID and more recently by the shortage of drivers. During both national issues, we had to prioritise refuse and recycling services and to make sure residents' bins were emptied. A further complication arising from the shortage of drivers has meant that we have been unable to maintain sufficient drivers. Ah, now we come to the nub that came at PR to our establishment list to deliver all the services. Again, this resulted in us prioritising critical and essential services. Unfortunately, it isn't just a matter of recruiting a driver. As a further difficulty we face is that the compact sweepers, the drivers there, have to have sufficient training to ensure they are competent in the vehicle use. We cannot take people from agencies or straight from recruitment to drive these units. To train a driver costs in the region of £1,000. And at that rate, we've been losing drivers on their replacements. It would not have made sense to arrange the drive for training while working through the aftermath of the pandemic and the national of shortage of drivers. So I look to Mr. Rusdale for affirmation of this um, because he clearly said at that meeting that this was a problem in the past and now won't be a problem as of now or in the future. So therefore, nothing needs to be done in any way to deal with something. In a sense, what you were talking about is something that happened as a result of the national shortage of drivers and the problems with COVID, and that is now to an end. Thank you, Councillor Colm, Vice Councillor McLeod. So we go. So Councillor. Yes, I wasn't going to speak, but I think Sarah's correct in what she says, uh, and I've totally reviewed uh, the wording of the motion which says it's a five-fathom approach. Totally refute the wording there. And the main reasons have been set out by Councillor Sarah Colvin Price and the reasons why there have been <coughs> difficulties is, firstly, there's the impact of Covid and then obviously the national shortage of drivers. And was it just Pendle Council having these difficulties? Councils across the country. And there's been some real recruitment challenges as well, but HR have uh, worked really well, so I'm grateful to uh, HR in, in, in getting uh, a team together. And hopefully in the next couple of weeks we should be up to uh, full capacity in terms of our drivers. Um, and I want to thank Council, uh, Council, say Council Walker, uh, David Walker uh, and, and his team for the fantastic work that they've been doing throughout COVID and, and since then in really challenging circumstances <laughs> with the difficulties they've had. And Mr Walker, we all know, is, is, is a brilliant officer. Every time you contact him, you get a reply uh, straight away. Late at night sometimes as well. And uh, amazing work. And I think uh, one of one put that on record for the, for the work that uh, Mr Walker does on behalf of the council and the residents. Uh, so the service that we, we have now is a much more focused approach uh, and it's, it's applied to areas <coughs> that are needed the most. So I think there is, there is a sensible approach uh, and in terms of, of course, the budget 
uh, savings as well, and also providing a service which is more efficient and addressing the areas of need. And that policy was most resource committee. This is the third time we're having this discussion again. On the, there's, there's a team here. Uh, we've discussed it at a budget meeting, we've discussed it at policy resource committee where uh, the Labour and the Conservative group did uh, support council groups. Amendments, and this is the third attempt uh, to bring the same item uh, forward, and we're discussing the same thing again. Councillor Ashford. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, can I just ask? Obviously, I'm hoping that we do have a full library, but not just street sweeping drivers, but the actual bin drivers as well as the lodge drivers. There is, there has been over the last six to twelve months quite a big sort of drivers when they do come out do speak to them every week or every week there is a different driver. But one thing I'd like to agree with Councillor Ahmed is that David Walker, under the pressure he has been, he's been an absolutely fantastic servant to this council. Yeah. Every time I drive him, there's never been a no, he's always there to help us wherever he wherever he can. So I'm just asking for clarification so we will be have a full squad of not just uh, street sweepers but drivers, being drivers as well. Because I think with the shortage of drivers, it has affected street sweeping over the last 12 months. Uh, I think it must be in all areas. Yeah, my understanding, we, we are nearly there in terms of having a full team. Uh, there is a bit of work to do, but hopefully I'm, I'm sure that it should, should be a full team very soon. Thank you, Councillor Lamez. Uh, don't we have any other speakers? Councillor, what do you want to um, In responding to the debate, uh, Mr Mayor, can I uh, put on record, and I think the Council should put on record, its appreciation of the drivers. Um, okay. Councillor Armand said, well, we should put on record the work that Mr Walker does. Point um, of, point of uh, clarification, I said Mr Walker and the team. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor. I merely say, Mr Mayor, we should look, put on record the appreciation <coughs> of the people who sweep our streets. And certainly they feel underappreciated at the moment because irrespective of Covid, irrespective of the national shortage of drivers, their numbers, the mechanical sweepers, uh, the drivers for the mechanical sweepers, have been cut from five to four. And they have been cut from five to four as a decision of this council last December. And during the budget, the Labour group attempted to reinstate that reduction in order that the drivers could be kept at five. And that is a matter of record. So, Councillor Corbyn Price. Uh, Sarah Corbyn Price says, oh, frequency is based on the needs of the area. And what is that code for? Yeah. Point of clarification. That was clearly Mr. Walker saying that. I was reading from Mr. Walker's letter. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, in this chamber, Councillor Sarah Corbyn Price said that the frequency is based on the needs of the area. Yep. Um, she may have been reading a letter, um, she could be reading it. An epistle and in the paragraph of the Bible for all I know. But that's what she said. Um, and she said that nothing needs to be done. Well, I think you'll find that the residents throughout Pendle who have found their street sweeping service decimated disagree that nothing needs to be done. They fully expect that the council tax that they're paying results in a service on their street. And when she talks about the needs of the area, I've seen the schedules, I've seen the reductions in the level of sweeping in certain areas. And I, I agree, some of the uh, most uh, littered areas, the frequency has not been reduced. But when you get to uh, the leafier suburbs, when you get to the readers of this world, when you get to those areas that, ooh, actually, they pay more council tax because the value of the, the properties is higher, they're in a higher council tax band, 
they're not seeing the mechanical sweepers, they are finding that the service has disappeared. Now, I believe strongly, Mr Mayor, that those drivers have an enormous amount of pride in what they do. They are, they are brilliant at trying to keep streets clean and they are distraught and their morale is at rock bottom because the new schedules do not allow them to go around at the frequency that is necessary and because they're not going around on a regular and routine basis, the debris is building up and it's more <coughs> difficult and the sweeper fills up more quickly, therefore they can't get around as fast and therefore the whole situation gets worse and worse and worse. <coughs> now, um, I, I think, Mr Mayor, I've responded to the day, um, this is clearly a case of the Conservatives saying, well, yes, but, uh, you know, black is, is, is white, or white is black, um, trying to pull the wool over people's eyes and say, well, you know, cutting the number of drivers doesn't affect the service. Well, I'm sorry, but the Orwellian concepts are not something that the majority of councillors in this chamber should accept. We should reinstate the service, we should reinstate the rules, we should reinstate the full strength of drivers, and we should do a decent job of keeping our streets. And we can do so by voting for this tonight. So we have a move and a second for the motion. Uh, can we have a show of hands of all those in favour of the motion?
Mr Mayor, if the gas that currently heats your home is sent instead to a power plant, um, converted to electricity, and then pumped to your home um, along transmission cables to then power an air source heat pump, it produces, even if it's 100% natural gas burning in a power generator, it is still better for the planet to heat your house with an air source heat pump than to burn it at home. Um, and that, that is an established fact. And it's something that we should set an example in this council. That is something we should be doing up and down the country, providing air source heat pumps um, for homes. And I think especially in the Brownfield site, showing that it is a, a doable option, um, it's sh something that we should be reaching for. Mr Mayor, just <coughs> commenting on some of the other um, fears that have come up. Noise, they operate the same noise level as um, air cons. Um, they hang outside the building, and much bigger than air cons, well, the same size. Um, and they can be running reverse, they can cool the house in the summer. Um, it is a proven technology. If someone's going to say otherwise, they're wrong. Um, and all, everyone considers tonight that this is a good step in the right direction. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Thomas. Councillor David Wick. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, this is a battle that uh, I've been fighting both on the board of Pearl Together and more recently at the Policy and Resources Committee. And, uh, the arguments have been rehearsed. Uh, during these <coughs> meetings of those two bodies. Okay. And um, someone, uh, Councillor Sarah Corbyn Price, said, that, well, they might be the beta mat uh, of the, of the uh, uh, climate change world. Uh, she was referring to you know, the, the, the competing technology that uh, uh, failed to, to take off when video cassette recorders uh, became widely available. Um, I just, I, I, I was staggered uh, when uh, she said that, because as Councillor Tongan said in moving this, uh, it is something that you know, operates in virtually every home in the, in the country, and uh, a lot of uh, homes, most homes in the developed world. Oh. Um, there seems to be some reluctance uh, to be at the leading edge of uh, uh, installing air source heat pumps. Now, I thought the Council's commitment to address climate change was real. I thought that the Council was um, wholeheartedly supporting cutting carbon emissions. I thought that the Council's policies would adapt and that we would have policies <coughs> that said um, air source heat pumps and other technologies uh, in order to, to re reduce uh, CO2 emissions would be introduced. I thought we had um, a climate change uh, or a climate crisis champion in the chair of the uh, working group, the climate emergency working group, and yet she's been the most vociferous opponent of introducing air source heat pumps. Another reason that's been advanced is, uh, well, nobody else has done it, uh, and, and, and we want to we want to have an example. Well, I would say to people, why is Penn Council not setting that example? If we were to have policies through the planning process that require uh, energy efficient measures in new homes, why are we not showing people that this is what they are and this is how they work? Uh, some people have said, well, there, there aren't any developers that are doing it. And uh, there is a, a national house builder who's building the development uh, in Burnley that um, they now use air source heat pumps as standard. So, you know, <coughs> there really isn't anything to be found with. And we have an opportunity through its joint venture in EAB, Pendle Council can create that exemplar and then we can use that as a lever to get other people 
uh, to do likewise. There has to be somebody that takes the first step. Well, it's not really the first step because thousands of first steps have been taken elsewhere in the country. It's just that in Penland we seem to be rather conservative. And we have a, a good example at the Oak Mill development in Com, which we championed a few years ago, because in order to make that work, uh, as a council, we put in £350,000 from the Brownfield Sites Fund in order to make it stack up. We can, do, we can do exactly the same in Erie with the Spring Mill development by proposing this £371,000, which can be afforded within the one and a quarter million pounds that there is in the Brownfield Sites Fund in order for this work <coughs> to proceed and for this council, as part of that joint venture, being prepared to put its money where its mouth is, invest in the technology that will help mitigate the climate crisis. And just remember, it's only a couple of weeks ago, uh, those searing temperatures of over 40 degrees, record-breaking <coughs> temperatures, which uh, between 2 and 4 degrees of that was due to the climate crisis, climate change, and the carbon cycle being disrupted. We have an opportunity here tonight to put something practical in place that will help address that. We should vote for it. No other speakers? No, sorry, House of Public Works. I'm hardly vociferous, really. Um, at the first meeting, I asked the, the board to investigate whether house prices going up would have an effect and perhaps the desirability of air source heat pumps would have an effect, an effect on, on the viability of this development because I was seeking to see, I can see Councilor Maru nodding his head, I was seeking to see whether the gap was in fact a lot closer than was presented and they did say at the time all the financing and, and talks of budgets had happened before Christmas, and loads has happened since Christmas, and people are really concerned about climate change, and I felt that people might be really keen to have these houses. So we decided to defer the decision, they decided to get the extra information, and they sent us this nine-page report. So I seized upon the report and thought, oh, you know, what do petties say? Is it all about the money? But when you read the report, it isn't all about the money. I have to take my specs off because I'm terribly short-sighted. So the thing is here, it's not about the money at all. The money is mentioned, but in fact, it's the sort of this particular form of development has very close small houses together. And these things, as has already been explained, act in reverse. So they're very loud in the winter, they're sort of 60 decibels, and nobody knows, because they couldn't find a comparable housing development anywhere in the country that had this proximity of houses with this proximity of air source heat pumps. And they sort of named all of the risks, which they wrote in capital letters in this report, the, the risk of an installed system on this scale, the siting within each property domain, so they have to be separate from the property, there has to be a gap. These are small <coughs> pots, these things are sizable units. They actually use a large amount of electricity, they actually are electricity bursting, and they said it's possible that this site in Erie doesn't couldn't meet the demand. <coughs> um, they have to reconfigure the interior of each house, the cylinder cupboards, rooms, doors, plumbing. I was less concerned about that. But the noise they felt would lead to complaints. And actually, when it was operating, they felt it would lead to significant problems. And they're very, very worried about whether they could get enough of them, and who would maintain them, and who would install them, and how effective they would be, because there was no example anywhere of, of a comparable development. And they were concerned that actually the big visual appearance of these big units in these small spaces would put people off. So, Take them all together, they felt there was an enormous risk. They are here. As stated, this is an untested system, and who knows what impact 53 
ASHPs in close proximity to one another would have on the scheme all the neighbouring properties. We have not been able to locate any large scale residential developments where ASHPs have been installed. And they then really pointed out, because I was very keen on the sort of climate change element, they said, these homes are the most efficient future home building standards. They offer future proofing ready for low carbon heating systems. They offer significant improvement to insulation and air tightness. They have improved ventilation standards. They have mitigation against overheating. They have solar panels. And they have very stringent U values and air tightness, as well as obviously you'd expect electric charging points. And so as you read through this sort of nine pages, you realise that it's not about the money. Um, you know, they say you can't, you can't screen these things. So in fact, <clears throat> I do feel that just based on sense, this, this can't pass. And also, in the meeting, there wasn't one person that supported Councillor Whip. None of the councillors supported him, and none of the board members did. So if you were to overturn that tonight, how would that play, taking that back to the Pearl Council, uh, the Pearl Board, that have made their decision on the logic of the report that most of you haven't seen? Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Price. Uh, Councillor Stone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, at a time when many of our residents and constituents are facing horrible choices between heating and eating. <coughs> it is regrettable that we have a proposal here to spend £371,000 to be a first mover of a technology which is unaffordable to ordinary residents. Um, £10,000-£15,000 for an ordinary resident to install a heat pump in their home, have their home refitted. Councillor Whip talks a lot about how we must demonstrate our commitment to climate change. <coughs> However, it is surely more important that we demonstrate our understanding and empathy with the residents of Pendle and that we spend money wisely, rather than in some vainglorious attempt at virtue signaling. Thank you, Councillor Stone. Uh, don't think we have any other speakers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. In, in terms of the debate and uh, discussion around this, uh, just, just so for those councillors who haven't been involved in all the meetings, this is the fourth meeting I'm sat in <coughs> discussing the same thing. And it's not as if the, uh, the Pearl uh, Together uh, board just threw this out and said, we don't want to discuss it, we don't want it. There was a, a detailed discussion, Council asked Jeff Mook was there, Sarah itself, and other board members. And there was a detailed discussion at the first board meeting where we felt we were unable to make a decision at that time, so we said we want further information. Hence, the report which Sarah referred to uh, was provided at the second meeting, and all the reasons uh, why it was felt unanimously that it wasn't suitable to proceed uh, as the councillor uh, wished. And so the point of trying to. Is personal yeah. explanation, Mr. Mayor. I referred to the board meeting of Pearl Together, I did not vote unanimously to reject this technology. Indeed, I voted the other way. Um, so, Councillor Ahmed is incorrect. As I, I say, I stand corrected. Yeah, you, you're right, Councillor Whip. Apart from Councillor Whip, uh, everybody else was in agreement. Uh, and there was a detailed discussion <coughs> at both the board meetings. Only last uh, week at the uh, Policy and Resources Committee meeting, there was a further detailed discussion made the same points which have been raised at Pearl uh, meetings and the same arguments which have been raised again here this evening. 
So to, to suggest that uh, the administration is responsible, uh, isn't thinking about climate change and climate emergency, I think is, is not correct. And the decision has been made by the board, uh, <coughs> which decided, based on all the information, the facts before uh, the board members, that it wasn't the right way to proceed. And that's the basis of the decision. The same outcome at the Policy and Resources Committee, and now this is uh, another attempt to uh, try and get this decision uh, overturned. Councillor Tom Whitby, your final statement, we can move to the board. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it seems to me that there was hesitancy regarding a new technology. And so they went back and looked at it and got a report back, a nine page report, on all of the negatives regarding this and all the unknowns. Mr. Mayor, if I was hesitant about the subject and got a nine page report back explaining all these negative things, I would be a bit taken aback. And I think that is a big example of confirmation bias. Yeah. It's, it's not a fair representative way to look at the pros and cons of a new technology. Um, Mr Mayor, the affordability of these things um, is not in question. They are affordable to the everyday person. Um, in fact, some of the, the new heat to, uh, the new air, air, air source heat pumps coming out a five to one in efficiency. Mr. Mayor, currently, well not currently, traditional um, electric heaters are 100% efficient. If you plug an electric heater into the wall, it will turn that electrical energy into heat energy 100% efficient. <coughs> Mr. Mayor, with that same electricity, an air source heat pump has a 500% efficiency. 500%. And that's only increasing. New technologies are coming out every year. It's developing. Uh, Mr. Mayor, there's a company in the area itself who provide air source heat pumps, Ashburn Stoves. Um, as much as they do provide wood burning stoves, they also offer greener alternatives, and they're a major proponent in the area. Um, Councillor Sarah Paulson Price referred to um, the nerve of the board around um, prospects. You know, like are they going to be as attractive with an air source heat pump in the garden, Mr. Mayor? The housing market has never seen more demand in history. Um, I doubt some air source heat pumps uh, would reduce um, the attractiveness of development to buyers. Um, prices are on the up uh, year on year. New buyers are being priced out. Um, and I think that's not going to change with new technology being installed. That will actually reduce their energy bills. Um, Mr. Mayor, I'm not going to repeat myself. Um, I just wish maybe that someone at Pearl had put a report together that explained all the positives as well, um, maybe nine pages of them, and maybe if that was presented instead of a nine page negative report, um, that some opinions might have been swayed. Mr. Mayor, um, I hope everyone supports this. It is a positive step. Um, it's not like we're stepping out into an unknown point. Um, <coughs> People are doing this already. It's just a question of the scale. It's just a question of putting ourselves out there, going out of our comfort zones, maybe, um, and doing something better for the planet. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, you Councillor Whitford. So, we have a, a motion, and that's been seconded. Can we have a show of hands of all those in favour of the motion? <coughs>